Welcome back, Mitochondriax, from the episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I am happy to be back with you today to talk about a very important topic relating to the iron-dependent cell death known as ferroptosis. And in particular, I would like to answer some questions that I've received kind of over and over again regarding does iron status matter when it comes to ferroptotic cell death of these cancer cells? And I dug through the literature and I was able to find some important information. So let's get into it. So I want to start out by giving a little backstory to the paper I want to present. And the way I'm going to do that is talk about a compound that is referred to in the paper and give its backstory. So this paper is titled Mechanisms of Ferroptosis and Relations with Regulated Cell Death, a review. It says here that RSL3 is also known as RAS Selective Lethal 3. And it's talking about a lot of organic chemistry here, which I don't think is going to be useful to the discussion. But what I will say is that RSL3 can react with the eight amino acid residues of glutathione peroxidase 4, which ultimately ends up inactivating glutathione peroxidase 4. And we know from prior videos that inactivating glutathione peroxidase 4, decreasing glutathione, increasing iron availability, et cetera, can increase the likelihood of ferroptosis happening by the excess reactive oxygen species, which would not be quenched during that process. And the next paper is titled Inactivation of Glutathione Peroxidase GPX4 by ferroptosis inducing molecule RLS3 requires the adapter protein 1433 epsilon. And it says that RAS selective lethal small molecule 3 or RSL3, a drug candidate prototype for cancer chemotherapy, triggers ferroptosis by inactivating the glutathione peroxidase, glutathione peroxidase 4, GPX4. And further down, it says the interaction of glutathione peroxidase 4 with a redox regulated adapter protein operating in cell signaling further contributes to frame it within redox regulated pathways of cell survival and death and opens new therapeutic perspectives. And the next paper is titled RAS selective lethal 3 induced ferroptosis promotes the anti tumor efficiency of anti programmed cell death protein 1 treatment in colorectal cancer cells. And ultimately, what we're seeing here is that the inducers of ferroptosis, in this case, we're using RSL3, but I, I personally believe that that could be literally any inducer of ferroptosis that we have talked about in the last several weeks, has synergistic effects with this anti-PD-1, which is a hot kind of immunotherapy that is being rolled out for a variety of cancers. And it says here that anti-programmed cell death protein 1, PD-1 treatment has exhibited clinical benefits in colorectal cancer. However, the low response rate of colorectal cancer to immunotherapy is an urgent problem that needs to be solved. So unfortunately, a lot of these blockbuster drugs end up having resistant phenotypic cancers. So they have to go and use other mechanisms as a way to help them work. And one of the ways that they have found that helps them work is RSL3 the inducer of ferroptosis. And we see here that there is the wild type cancer cells here, and then they are exposed to this anti-PD-1 treatment. And then they're also exposed to RSL, but when used in combination, you see a much greater response because of the synergy there. And the reason that I bring that up, and I just want to show a picture here of where this is located at. So this is the classic transporter that we've been looking at for the last several weeks, this SLC781, glutamine cysteine antiporter, which is responsible for bringing in the extra cysteine to make glutathione and deal with the excess reactive oxygen species to protect from ferroptosis in these cancer cells. And we see that this RSL3 is blocking glutathione peroxidase so that this glutathione that's being made cannot be recycled effectively and participate in further redox chemistry to help further protect from lipid peroxidation and ferroptosis. So I just want to give a little bit of a a graphic of where this VSL is actually acting in concert with the entire kind of ferroptosis picture. And the reason that I do all of that backstory is to set us up for this. Essentially, the answer to the question about iron supplementation and if it's going to be harmful or helpful in this process of ferroptosis. And I think that most of us, our gut told us that it probably would be helpful, but I wanted to show evidence to support that. So this paper is titled Iron Supplementation Enhances RSL3-Induced Ferroptosis to Treat Naive and Prevent Castration-Resistant Prostate Cancer. And it says here that 
Prostate cancer is a leading cause of death in male population, commonly treated with androgen deprivation therapy that often relapses as androgen independent and aggressive castration resistant prostate cancer. Ferroptosis is a recently described form of cell death that requires abundant cytosolic labile iron to promote membrane lipid peroxidation and which can be induced by agents that inhibit the glutathione peroxidase 4 activity, such as RSL3. That's why I gave that big long backstory to see what RSL3 is. Exploiting in vitro and in vivo human and murine prostate cancer models and the TRAMP model of prostate cancer, we show that RSL3 induces ferroptosis in prostate cancer cells and demonstrate for the first time that iron supplementation significantly increases the effect of RSL3 triggering lipid peroxidation, enhancing intracellular stress and leading to cancer cell death. Moreover, the combination with the second generation anti-antigen drugs, enzalutamide, potentiates the effect of the RSL plus iron combination leading to superior inhibition of prostate cancer and preventing the onset of castrate resistant prostate cancer in the TRAMP mouse model. These data open new perspectives in the use of pro ferroptotic approaches alone or in combination with this anti-androgen drug, enzalutamide, for the treatment of prostate cancer. And I'm gonna look at a couple of graphs here, and this is tumor volume. And you're seeing that in the non-treated group, the NT group is just basically exponential growth of these prostate cancer cells. And when you see that if you add iron, there's not a whole lot of difference here, which means that this has to be in combination. And when you add RSL3, you see a significant drop. And then when you have RSL3 plus iron, you see another significant drop. So again, combination approaches make the most sense at exploiting these Achilles heels. And this is the GU or the prostate mass over body weight. And we see that in the non-treated, we see the highest amount, of course. We see androgen deprivation therapy here, and we see RSL plus iron. And then if you add all these three together, you see the biggest effect in this particular prostate cancer model. I'm gonna move on to this next paper, which is titled, Iron Administration Overcomes Resistance to Aristen Mediated Ferroptosis in Ovarian Cancer Cells. And it says that these ovarian cancer cells with low baseline intracellular labile iron pool appear resistant to Aristen. And if you remember, Aristen is one of the prototypic blockers of SLC7A11, we talked about it in a prior video. It's one of the prototypic inhibitors of SLC7A11. So what it's saying here is that these cancer cells are resistant to Ariston because they have this baseline, this low baseline intracellular labile iron pool, or it's done a very good job of protecting itself against free iron. And notably, the use of ferrolixic sensitized these ovarian cancer cells to Ariston through this NCOA4 independent intracellular iron accumulation and mitochondrial dysfunction. Ferrolixit alone mimics Ariston's effects and promotes ferroptosis in these ovarian cancer cells. So we have the untreated, and then we have this Ariston group at eight hours that has very little change because these particular cells have a very low amount of iron availability. So therefore the ferroptotic process does not happen with just the blockade of SLC7A11 in this particular model. But when you add Ferrolixit, which is a, just a supplemental iron brand at 24 hours, you see an, a slightly more amount of cell death at a higher concentration. You see really no difference to Ariston, but at 48 hours, we see that the lower dose iron had profound effects at 48 hours, as well as similar effects with the higher concentration of iron supplementation. And then when they combined the iron at 24 hours, so that's looking at this particular bar plus this bar shows a huge decrease in the same amount of time. So again, this is not one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals five. This is synergy. And this is what makes the most sense when looking at cancers and mitochondrial metabolic disease. When you block glucose, when you block glutamine, when you block SLC7A11, when you add iron to the mix, you're getting effects that are exponentially greater than one by itself. And that's why these things cannot be studied in a vacuum. You'll never get the effect that you're looking for when you study these things in a vacuum. They have to be studied in synergy. That's why when I look at those studies from Don that were not effective using IV formulations, but the by mouth were more effective, but still not effective as you would expect something that has profound effects on glutamine to have. It makes sense that when you add and you put that in combination with the press pulse framework and you have this beautiful synergy happening, you're going to see radically improved results compared to these things used in a vacuum. It's kind of like a Jenga board where you have some of these pieces that are like 
critical pieces to holding up the whole thing. When you take out some of the critical pieces, the thing just has to fall down. It just has to fall down because it relies on those things so heavily. And that's why glucose, glutamine, and iron in combination likely would have unbelievable effects. I hope this was uh, good for you guys. I, I was very excited to find these results out. Um, I know that a lot of you guys had asked the question about iron supplementation and whether or not it would affect this process. And my gut told me that it would, but as you can see now that it has profound effects and it doesn't take, the high doses didn't make a, a huge difference. It didn't seem like, at least in this particular study with ovarian cancer. So, you know, dosing, timing, and scheduling, of course, is between you and your doctor and probably to be determined. And there's going to be some nuance with that because obviously we don't want you to overload iron. We don't want you overdoing anything, but being deficient probably is a problem. And, you know, reasonable supplementation probably would also make sense as a way to augment and enhance the ferroptosis that we are trying to trigger utilizing other modalities. So if you like this video, please like it. If you have someone in your life that could use this information, please share it with them. If you're not yet a subscriber, please go ahead and just hit that subscribe button. And until next time.